speaking on the Praxis Early Childhood Education 5025. And I'm really excited to be here with you today on this Saturday morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Just a quick introduction. My name is Kathleen Jasper. I own Kathleen Jasper LLC, and I specialize in helping teachers and prospective leaders pass their certification exams. So if you are in the live webinar right now, you should be able to join the chat. So just let me know that you can hear me and see me, and that would be great. You can also introduce yourself to other people in the room. We had a lot of people sign up for this webinar. So hopefully you'll get something out of this today. I am also live on Facebook and YouTube. So if you are watching me live on Facebook and YouTube, then you can join the actual webinar by using the link in the description. So if you want to get the free study guide and you want to participate in the actual live webinar, you can do that by clicking the link in the description. It'll take you to a form. You sign up. It'll push you over to a thank you page. On that thank you page is the free study guide and the link to join the actual webinar. Or you can just stay in social media right now and watch me live and you can download the study guide later. So I'm really excited to see you guys. I got people from New Jersey here. Looks like you guys can hear me. It is hot, sticky, and muggy here in Florida, but I'm sure if you're in New Jersey, you would prefer that than what you guys are getting hit with over the last couple of days. So I will take the hot, sticky weather any day. Um, all right, so today we're doing the early childhood exam, Praxis 5025. But if you are studying for any early childhood exam, pre-K through third, depending on what state you're in, this is going to help you because many of those tests are very similar and they cover the same material. So regardless of what test you're taking, this is going to help you. So it looks like we've got people from the Bayou, Louisiana, California, awesome, New Jersey. So glad to see you guys here today. Now in the chat, in the actual webinar. I have a colleague, her name is Yana, and she's gonna communicate with you guys when I cannot, because if I'm in my presentation, it's hard for me to communicate with you guys, um, you know, and do my presentation. But I'll pop back over periodically to just check on you for, you know, see what kind of questions you guys have. So yeah, I got New Jersey, Rhode Island, Louisiana, Alabama, awesome, Idaho, wonderful, Pennsylvania. So we got people from all over, Las Vegas, perfect. Um, so today we are going to go through the structure of the 5025. I'm gonna show you some quick tips and study strategies and things like that. I'm also gonna show you where to get some paid resources and some free resources. If you guys are here um, looking for early childhood online courses or free webinars or other things like that, I'm gonna point you in that direction, okay? So most, people in the United States take some sort of teacher certification exam in their subject area in order to get certified. And that's what this exam is. So you have the Praxis Core, which is a basic skills test. And then you have a test like this, which is what we call a subject area exam. So your subject area exam is the one you take when you want to teach a specific grade level and content area. So this is going to be early childhood, pre-K three teachers, pre-K through third teachers. You know, if you want to teach middle school math, there's a middle school math subject area. If you want to teach high school social studies, there's a high school social studies subject area. So today we're focusing on that early childhood education. And there are five content categories. Now, really quickly, I just want to go over the resources that you guys get when you do the, um, the, webinar with us. So we are going to be working on or working through this free study guide here. So this is what you got when you signed up for the webinar. So this has got a bunch of problems in it. It's pretty comprehensive for a free study guide, if I do say so myself. It's got 10 problems for each content category. So there's 10 problems for the language and literacy portion. There are 10 problems, sorry, I'm probably making you dizzy, 10 problems for the math, 10 problems for the social studies, 10 problems for the science and 10 problems for the um, health, physical education, creative arts. So five content categories total. That means there's 50 total questions on this, ex on this free study guide. But of course, we have a paid study guide. I'll just bring this over here, which has a lot more. So if I go over to my pages here, you can see that it's much more 
comprehensive and we have a lot more practice test questions. We have practice test questions at the end of each content category. And then of course we have the practice test at the end that is the full practice test. Now, we also have reference guides and things like that in the paid study guide, but you can also just use our free materials too, and that works. So a lot of people pass the test with our free stuff, but if you're looking for more, we do have a full study guide. Now, let me show you where to get that so that you know um, what's going on. Now, if you're in the webinar, you're going to get an offer code and a follow-up email and all of that. So after this webinar is over, you're going to get an email that gives you all the things that we talked about today along with an offer code. But if you're interested in more, all you have to do is go over to my um, website, kathleenjasper.com. Let me just go to the main page here. And what you can do is go under our programs and it, all you have to do is click early childhood. You can see here that this is the green book here. Now we do have an online course, which comes with everything. So the online course, you get videos, extra practice, all of that. And it also comes with the digital study guide. So you don't have to buy both when you buy the online course. So just remember that. Um, but you may just want the study guide. So if you just want the study guide, you can get that and digital form on our website. So you just click add to cart. As soon as you purchase, it'll send you an email with the PDF and you can put that into your Adobe Acrobat Pro and highlight in there and all of that. But I know a lot of you prefer a physical copy. I do not recommend buying the digital and printing it because it is 200 and 20 pages. That's a lot to be um, printing out, right? So if you want a physical copy, you prefer a physical copy, and a lot of people do, just click this Amazon button here, and it'll take you to Amazon, and you can buy it on Amazon Prime. It'll get to your house in like two days. You can see we have a lot of five-star ratings for this particular um, study guide. So a lot of people love it. There's a lot of information in it there. Okay, so those are some of our resources. Now, again, you could just do it all with our free stuff. We have lots of information in this webinar and the free study guide might get you there. But if you need more help, we have that on our website and I will send you an email with all that information in just a little bit as soon as this webinar is over. So some of you say you already got the green book. It's this lime green book. That's the early childhood. And um, let's just take a couple questions here. So. Uh, what's the difference between the Praxis 1 and the Praxis 2? Okay, I have a whole blog on this. So if Yana, if you're listening, add that to the email. The Praxis 1 is the Praxis Core. That's the basic skills test. That's It's kind of like an ACT. It assesses your skills in reading comprehension, um, grammar and English, and then math. And of course, it has a writing component that is in with the grammar portion. It's not specific to any content area. The Praxis 2 is the subject area. That is the exam you take in the area that you want to teach. And it looks like Yana just, she's way ahead of me. She put the um, the blog in the chat there. So if you would like to read that, um, you can click that link later, stay in the presentation right now, and we'll also send that in the email follow-up, okay? Um, I ordered your book on Amazon. It came on Thursday, no discount. <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot give discounts on the books through Amazon. They are the publisher and we can't just give a discount. We do disc we will discount for this webinar for webinar participants on our website. If you're interested in the online course, you can always send us proof of purchase from Amazon and we will discount the online course, um, the amount you paid for the book. So you just have to share us a screenshot. You can you know, black out your address and all of that. And um, we will send you an offer code for that price off of the online course if you want to get the online course as well. Okay. I know, but my book got torn in a wreck Tuesday and I can't read any of the pages. Alicia, um, if your book got damaged, why don't you reach out to us via email and we'd be happy to send you a um, digital copy. So Alicia, just reach out to us. We, we want to help our teachers. And if it got... Um, damaged in a wreck. I hope you're okay. And we will hook you up with a digital copy. Um, okay. Somebody's asking about the Florida test. This, we don't, we don't prep for FTCE. Um, we don't prep for Florida exams specifically. This test is for the praxis, but it will help you. So this is a free webinar. I highly recommend you check it out. It's going to help you in any, uh, early childhood exam. So definitely stay. All right. Here's another question. How many do you have to get right to pass? This is a question we get all of the time. 
there's no way to know exactly how many questions you need right to pass. So um, I recommend when you're studying and you're doing the practice test, when you get to a 75% correct total, you're in the safe zone. That means you are in the passing range. Now you do not need a 75% correct on this exam. You need closer to like a low D to pass the exam. You don't need a hundred, you don't need an A, a B, or even a C. A low D or a middle D, will you'll pass the exam. But I always say when you're practicing, shoot for 75% correct because that puts you in like a really good safe zone to pass. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So, um, and oh, let's see, someone, Tracy said, Louisiana has waived the Praxis one. Yes, New Jersey, and it looks like Louisiana have stopped requiring the Praxis core. So that's good news for some states. Here's one thing I will say before we jump into the presentation. Please make sure you check with your specific state's Department of Education to figure out exactly what you need to do. So education is left to the states and they determine what their teachers need. Now, the Praxis is a national exam that a lot of states have adopted, but the state determines what you need. So what is required for New Jersey, Alabama, Nevada, Alaska, it's all different. There are also similarities, but it's very important that you check with your State Department of Education. And you can get a lot of that information on the ETS website as well. They have, like if you search your state, they'll have everything laid out right there for you, okay? So, um, let's get started. There's a couple things that you should definitely do first when studying for any Praxis exam, and that is to download the study companion by the actual test maker. Now, if you're studying for the Praxis, it's called the study companion. If you're um, prepping for any other exam, it's usually called a blueprint or test specification, but it's all the same thing. So what I recommend you do, and let me just go here. What I recommend you do is you Google Praxis 5025 Study Companion. And when you do, you will see Education Testing Service. That is ETS. That is the company that makes the exam. This right here, do you see how it says PDF right here? That's going to take you to the actual test specs. I highly recommend you click this, download it, and read that test specification. You don't have to necessarily memorize it, but the language in the test specs is the good language you'll see in the correct answer choices on the exam. Now, all of my books are aligned with these test specs. These are like my Bible. I use these to make sure I'm covering all of the information you're tested on on the exam, but I highly recommend you download this. And you can see like when you Google this, I pop up everywhere because we've been prepping for this exam. So we have lots of YouTube videos. We have obviously our book and things like that. So check that out. But you really wanna look at that study companion. That is really, really important, okay? All right, so let's get into it. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump over to my presentation. These are test questions taken from that free study guide that you guys got when you joined the webinar. If you don't have it on you right now, don't worry. I'd rather you listen to the presentation and download it later. We're not going to cover every single question in that study guide, the free study guide, because there are 50 of them and we'd be here a lot longer than an hour. And I'm really going to try to keep this in under an hour. I try every week and sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not. Um, but we're going to jump around. I have them numbered according to the study guide. So if you have the study guide and you want to follow along, you can do that. Again, we are working from the free study guide that came with this webinar when you signed up. Okay. Um, so follow along with me here or on your study guide and we will, um, we will cover everything we can today, all right? So let me go here, share screen, and let's pop over to this right here. So we are doing Praxis Early Childhood 5025. This is the subject area exam for the early childhood, those of you who are trying to get certified in pre-K through third, all right? So let's just have a quick look at the structure. Understanding the structure of the exam is one of the most important things. 
Because when you kind of know what the structure is, you can think like a test maker. I always say think like a test maker and really be strategic in your studies. Okay. So you can see that you have two hours for 120 selected response questions. Now they don't call it multiple choice because selected response means that sometimes there isn't just one correct answer. Sometimes it'll say, choose all that apply or choose two or choose three. That's why they're called selected response. Response, but they're like multiple choice questions. Pretty much most of them are multiple choice, but there's always a couple where you cho choose more than one. There is no writing on this particular exam. So you're lucky with that. You don't have to write any essays. You just have to go through and choose the correct answer. So, so that's really good. There are five content categories. The first one is language and literacy. This is going to be all about those foundational skills of reading, phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, alphabetic principle. Now I have a YouTube to playlists with so many videos about this. And of course, we cover it very extensively in the online course. This is the bulk of the test at 36 questions. There are more questions on the exam about language and literacy than any other portion. And that's because the most important thing you could do for young learners is give them a really good foundation in literacy because it leads to success in all other academic areas. Coming in second at 30 questions is the math. And of course, math is another really important subject area to get students started on the path to success. So there are going to be those foundational math skills, place value, um, decomposition of numbers, some of that new common core math that we may not be super acquainted with if we haven't been in school in a while. But I lay all that out in the study guide as well. And then we start to get into about half of those questions with the social studies, the science, and the health and physical education. So social studies is kind of interesting on this test. You will have some basic social studies questions on geography and you know US history and citizenship and world history and things like that. But you'll also have some questions about um, early childhood development. So self-efficacy, self-esteem, um, Piaget's stages of cognitive development. And the reason why they put that in the social studies section is because that is all about human development. And that is a social studies content area. Okay. How humans interact with one another, how they develop and things like that is a social studies content area. And then we get into science. This is going to be divided into three main categories. It's going to be earth space. So everything about the earth, the earth's crust, stars, the moon, the sun, the planets, and it's going to be about mountains, volcanoes, you know, earthquakes, things like rocks, things like that. The second part of the science is going to be life science. So everything that has to do with biology. So from the cell all the way out to ecosystems. So definitely cell theory. Um, it's also going to have stuff on there about heredity. Uh, basic though, remember this is pre-K through third. However, if you haven't taken a science exam in a long time, some of these concepts like open circulatory system versus closed circulatory system might be hard for you because you just haven't been exposed to those questions in a long time. So make sure you brush up on that. And then the last one is health and physical education. So PE questions. And then they also lump in some creative and performing arts because those are those specials that the kids go to, you know, their drawing class, their art classes, um, Roy G. Biv, like remembering the, the main colors on the color wheel, um, physical education, obviously those fine and gross motor skills. We'll go over a little bit of that today. And that comes in at 17 questions. So this is the bulk of the exam. And of course, it's broken down into more specifics. Now, the first content category, let's get started in language and literacy. Again, this is the biggest content category on the exam because it is is arguably the most important, although math teachers will tell you math is more important. Um, both are very important, but the language and literacy really lays the foundation. And so you might come across a test question that looks like this. So you can see that this has a big question and then it has your answer choices here. I always say work backwards. That's how I think like a test maker. And I try to tell people that. I like to look at the item as a whole before I start reading. What people tend to do is they start up here 
and they read all the way down. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. If you prefer that, that's fine. But I like to kind of look here at the answer choices and see what's required of me first, which sets the purpose of what's going to happen here. Now you can see, I just have some one or two word answer choices. So I can't really identify good words to kind of zero in on and eliminate bad words. This looks like I have to just choose what's going on. So let's go ahead and read question one, knowing that we've got some of these reading skills in the answer choices. A teacher reads the story, The Giving Tree, to first grade students. She has students use a graphic organizer. Okay, I like to pick out keywords there where they match pictures from the story to the beginning, middle, and end. Well, right away, I can see that that's going to move me to plot sequence. That's why I like to read the answer choices first, because a lot of times I don't even have to read the whole item. I can get to the answer more quickly by understanding what's going on here. Now, this part here, the students then share their graphic organizers with a partner. This is just fluff. This is what test makers put in there just to make it longer, maybe to confuse you a little bit. It's just kind of the strategy of the test makers. But because I read the answer choices first, I don't even have to read that. I can just zero in on plot sequence. Now it's definitely not character development because it didn't talk anything about in the item about the characters. It's talking about beginning, middle, and end. Point of view is also not addressed here. Is it in first person, second person, third person? That's not being addressed here. And setting would be describing where the story takes place. And that also is not happening. We're talking about a sequence. So this is going to be plot sequence B. All right, let's have a look at another one here. So we, again, have some skills, directionality, sequencing, leveling, and pictures. Can't really eliminate any just by the answer choices, but it helps me to understand what's going on. In number two, a kindergartner, a kindergarten teacher displays an oversized book in the front of the class. As the teacher reads the lines in the book, she sweeps her hand from left to right. Well, right away, that's gonna lead me to directionality right? Showing students we read from left to right, top to bottom, front to back. That's all about this. This is called print concepts. We cover that more extensively in the book, but we have to teach students how to use books and how to read books and how to read stories. And that's what the teacher is doing this. So the teacher is working on directionality. It's not sequencing because we're not talking about what happens first, second, third in the class, in the story. Leveling is not the answer here. Leveling is when teachers decide what level students are going to read. So you might have students reading on grade level, you might have students reading below grade level, and you might have students reading above grade level. And so you're going to level out the books. You might have a group of students reading you know, higher than their, than their reading level. You might have students um, using some support materials that reads a little bit easier. That's leveling. And pictures is kind of an, just a, a throw off. We're not talking about pictures here. We're talking about directionality. And this is all about print concepts, a major part of the language and literacy portion for pre-K through third students. All right, let's have a look at this one here. All right. So Right away, I want to take a look at this picture and I want to take a look at these answer choices. Now I can see that these words are broken up by onset and rhyme. So that's going to lead me to A. Notice I'm working backwards and I'm already getting the correct answer. Now it doesn't mean I shouldn't read the question because the question might be asking me something different. But if I can take a look at the picture and take a look at the answer choices, I'm better prepared. So what is onset and rhyme? Well, onset is the consonant or consonant cluster at the beginning of the word. So in this word track at the top here, the onset is ter and the rhyme, and we call that R-I-M-E, is ac, which is the vowel and the consonants that close out the word, okay? Now this is a pho phonological awareness skill. Right away I can cross off phonemic awareness because phonemic awareness is breaking up words by sounds, individual sounds, t, er, a, k. That would be phonemic awareness. Phonological awareness is breaking up bigger pieces of the word. Now I know phonological versus phonemic can get kind of mixed up. I have a lot of videos on this as well. 
But think of phonological awareness as the big umbrella. It's going to be bigger chunks of words, maybe breaking it up into syllables like apple, um, uh, rabbit, right? The bigger chunks of the word, onset and rhyme, ter ac. This is going to be phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness is more nuanced where we're like ter ac. For break, phonological awareness would be ber ache. Phonemic awareness would be b er ache. Notice they're similar in that it's sounds only, but phonemic awareness is more nuanced. And I can cross that off because that's not what's happening here. Cueing systems is actually a vocabulary um, strategy where we help students figure out the words based on different things going on. So there's semantic cueing, syntactic cueing, um, graphophonic cueing, and uh, syntactic. Didn't I say that? Syntactic, semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic. Um, and that's not happening here. And syllables I can cross off because these are all one syllable words. So we're not breaking up by syllables. Now let's just read the question to make sure we answered correctly. Students are using the chart below for a classroom activity. They are matching different parts of the words to make a whole word. What are the students working on? Well, this is onset and rhyme here. Now, really important uh, foundational skill in reading, and you're gonna see a lot of questions about that on the exam. All right, let's have a look at number nine. And this is about those cueing systems. I can see right now, semantic, syntactic, graphophonic, and pragmatic. If I've studied for the exam and I have a good understanding of the study guide, I know that these are cueing systems. So it's gonna set me up to better read the question. All right, so let's go here. A student is reading through a piece of text. When he gets to a difficult word, he uses pictures and other words to determine the unknown word's meaning. The student is using which cueing system? All right. When we talk about meaning, we're talking about the semantic cueing system. And the way I remember that is the M in semantic goes with meaning. All right. Um, syntax is the grammar in the word. So for example, if a student's reading and the whole sentence is in present tense, if a student gets to a difficult word, they might use that in order to pronounce the word properly with the ing ending. If the if the sentence or passage is in the past tense, that will help them understand maybe bigger words that are that end in ed because they know the the syntax. Graphophonic is the actual spelling. It has that phonic in it. Phonics is letter sound correspondence. All right. So phonics, you actually have to look at the word and figure out why, uh, what sounds it makes based on the letters. So for example, in the word receive, that's kind of a big word for, for pre-K three, but just for the context of this presentation, we know that this C makes a S sound or an S sound because it's followed by an E, I, or Y. That's a phonics rule. That's a decoding strategy. That's a code-based rule. And in order to do phonics, we have to see the word. Phonemic and phonological awareness just has to do with the sounds in words, but phonics has to do with letter sound correspondence, also called grapheme phoneme correspondence. Grapheme or graph is the letter. It's the writing, right? And uh, phoneme is the sounds. So in this case, the student is not using the way the, the, the word is spelled. The student is using pictures, which is going to give us the semantic. Now, there is another cueing system called pragmatic. You'll sometimes see it, although most of the time they just reference the three, semantic, syntactic, and graphophonic. Pragmatic has to do with social cues and is usually, um, it's usually referred to in ESOL or students who are ELL, English language learners, English lear learners, you'll hear it both ways. And pragmatic has to do with social cues. So the way you would say something to a teacher is different than you would say it to your friend, right? You, you might say to your friend, hey, give me that pencil right? Because it's your friend and you don't care. But you wouldn't say, give me that pencil to the teacher. You would say, may I please have that pencil, right? So those social cues have to do with pragmatics. And that's not really related here. A is the best answer because we're talking about meaning. 
All right. And let's do one last one for the language and literacy. So number 10 here. Now, this is a good one to work backwards with because I have those long answer choices. All right. So let's have a look at A. Lower the standards so those struggling can meet their goals. Absolutely not. You're going to want to cross anything out that indicates lowering the standard. Now, you might be like, well, sometimes we make things easier for students who are struggling. Yes, we do. But the goal is to keep the standard exactly where it is because every student has to take a standardized assessment at the end of the year, right? And if you constantly lower the standards for students who are struggling, they're not going to meet that benchmark at the end of the year. You're actually setting them up to fail. What we want to do is keep the standard high and scaffold and support to help push those students up to that high standard. So any answer choice that says lower the standards or make it easier is usually not the correct answer. B, differentiate instruction and accommodate learners in meeting their goals. Now, this has all the good words in it. I love this answer choice. Differentiate instruction. It, it might say modify instruction. The word accommodate, meaning we are helping, we are meeting students where they are to help push them along. This is what good teachers do. All right. So B's got all the good words in it. C, pair students with more advanced students for peer tutoring. Okay, now this is one of those where you might say, well, that could be correct. If students are struggling, I would put them with a, a more advanced student. We do that sometimes, but here's the thing, on the exam and in your classroom, you're the teacher. You want to make sure that you are the one who is differentiating instruction and accommodating that student. You can't leave it to a high achieving student to be the peer tutor. Now, it is helpful and this will be a correct answer on the test if you get a question like this, where you're using cooperative learning um, with mixed ability, uh, mixed ability students to kind of help them interact with one another um, in a more authentic way. And a lot of times the high flyers will take a leadership position and help those who are struggling. And it kind of happens authentically in that, in that way. And that is a benefit of cooperative learning. But we don't want to lean on peer tutoring to help our struggling students. Struggling students need specific interventions done by us, the professional. So be careful about these like pairing students for peer tutoring. I'm not saying it's never the correct answer, but it's definitely not as good as B in this situation. All right. And D, use incentives to motivate students to meet their goals. Now, if you're new to teaching, you might say, of course we do this. I give candy out. I give homework passes. I give all kinds of stuff to my students. And I did too as a teacher. It works. But on the exam, using extrinsic rewards like candy and homework passes and extra time on the playground is usually not the correct answer. We want to push those intrinsic motivators. We want students to do things because it's the right thing to do. And I know you're like, well, they're not going to do that all the time, of course. But what happens is if we rely too much on incentives, those incentives wear off and it can lead to, um, you know, demotivation. So we want to do what is in B here. Now, I haven't read the question yet. So just to make sure, let's read the question. Which of the following would be most effective approach to helping students with varying needs and literacy? This word varying should bring us down to differentiate. Each student in the class is going to be different and it's our job to differentiate accordingly. It's really hard to do even for the best teachers in the world, but we got to try the best we can. We don't lower the standards. We don't want to rely on other students and we don't want to use incentives. Instead, we use assessments to diagnose students' deficits. We target interventions to go in and help them with those deficits and push them up, up, up to meet the standards. Of course, this isn't a perfect world. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's what we want to strive to do there. Okay. So that's language and literacy. If you notice with number 10, I, th I was thinking like a test maker. I went straight to the answer choices first, eliminated bad words like lower the standards, peer tutoring and incentives, got rid of the bad words right away, zeroed in on the good words like differentiated instruction and accommodating learners to meet their goals, good words all the way around, grabbed it, then I read the question. So this has helped thousands of people pass their exam. You may like this strategy, you may not. You may prefer to read from top to bottom, that's okay too. I just know that this works for me and works for a lot of other people.
All right, let's move on to the math portion here. After math, I'm going to jump back into my um, webinar and just see if any of you have questions. So I'll go through the questions in just a second. So math is going to be foundational skills in math. And again, this is a large part of the exam. Um, language and literacy and math make up the bulk of the exam. So we want to make sure that we have uh, a good, good foundation here. So we're going to have questions like this, which is kind of weird because a lot of people haven't seen these types of skills before. This has a lot to do with the common core way of teaching math and teaching students really about numbers and how to decompose them and things like that. So I see this die here and I can see I'm looking at the different dots on the die. And so this is going to lead me, because I read the study guide and I know what's going on, this is going to lead me to subitizing, but I really need to read the question first to understand. So let's have a look at that. A teacher is using dice to help students recognize numbers. She rolls one die and the students immediately say three, because it landed on three here. What skills are the students and teachers working, are, and the teacher working on? Okay. So this is subitizing. Subitizing is when you see like patterns of dots or a group of something and you can immediately say, oh, that's six or oh, that's two. It could be like two squares like this or three. And the student can immediately go, that's three. That's really important in math. Now, of course, if there are 33 of these squares or dots, you're not going to be able to do that, right? That's you got to kind of count them out. But when we help students understand, like quickly identify, you can see that this is two pairs of three. They start to kind of understand the way numbers are represented. This is subitizing, all right? Now, transitivity patterns and decomposition are different skills. Transitivity is when uh, students transfer what they know about one number to another. Patterns are like if it goes like two and then four and then eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can see that we're multiplying this by two every time. Those are patterns. It could be any kind of pattern. And decomposition is when we decompose a number. So for example, like 340, this is 340 and then zero in the ones. So that's a type of decomposition. But in this case, we're working on subitizing because we're just identifying numbers that we see represented in dots or boxes or things like that. All right, let's have a look at number three. Answer choices first. These are skills here. I can't really um, eliminate anything here. Now, I like to go to the question stem sometimes, which says which prerequisite skill must the students master before they can meet this new objective? So what's the new objective? A teacher is helping students work towards the objective of classifying and categorizing geometric shapes. Now, this can be difficult if you're a new teacher because there are some questions on the exam about skill progression. And typically they're not too complex. Um, in this case, this one's pretty easy. If we're getting, if we're categorizing, this is a step up, right? We might have a bunch of different shapes and we might be categorizing them based on their attributes. This should kind of lead you to attributes because in order to categorize a shape, I have to know like, okay, is it a square? Is it a circle? How many corners does it have? How many angles does it have? How many sides does it have? Those are all attributes. And if we can recognize attributes, we can then categorize geometric shapes. So C is going to be the best answer. Defining area is way advanced. Defining area is like geometry, base times height. Uh, or using an array to do that. Um, drawing shapes, I guess drawing shapes could be related, but recognizing shape attributes is a better prerequisite skill for this. And identifying patterns isn't necessarily going to help us categorize. Identifying patterns is like what I showed you there. So maybe it's a triangle and then it's like a triangle. Uh, how do they do that? Oh gosh. I don't know, like they make little patterns and then they split it up again. Sorry, I'm, you know, they split it up another way and they go and they go and they go. That's the patterns. For categorizing geometric shapes, we need to understand its attributes so that we can categorize it properly. So C is going to be the best answer there. 
All right, let's have a look at number eight here. So I can see I have multi-digit numbers, estimation, subitizing, and place value. I can also see it says what skill is the teacher working on. And if I continue to work backwards, I can see I have 345 with the four underlined. Now, right away, I can cross off subitizing because um, we're not looking at like a group of uh, like dots or squares, like we said before. So this kind of helps me working backwards, eliminate one. Now it could be multi-digit numbers because this is a multi-digit number. It could be estimation because I have a five there. She might be, the teacher might be trying to show students how to estimate. And it certainly could be place value, which I'm leaning towards because it has a place value underlined, which is the four. But I need to read the question in order to really understand. So let's do that. A teacher is using the number below and ask, what is the value of the underlying number? Well, this is place value because the kids would say 40, right? Because the four is in the tens spot. So four times 10 is 40. In this case, that's going to be place value. Now we definitely go into that more in the study guide. Place value is one that's can be complicated. Some of these, uh, pr you know, pre-K through third skills are tough. So really pay attention to that math. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to just go in and see what kind of questions we have. All right. Do you have a webinar for the Praxis Core? Yes, I do. Go to KathleenJasper.com. Under webinars, you'll see a recorded Praxis Core right there. Um, let's see here. Will you be sending an email? Yes, we will. After this webinar, you will be um, getting an uh, email with that. Let's just see if anybody's got questions about the actual... Um, I love this breakdown. Thank you. I'm a first year teacher. Okay. To my first year teachers, really quickly, this is hard because you're just getting acclimated in the classroom and your school may not be doing things the way that is outlined in the test. I say that not to diss your school or anything, but when we're in the classroom, we're in like survival mode. We're doing things that we have to do, like the incentives thing. Like I, I bribed an entire high school biology class because I taught high school biology with chicken sandwiches from Chick-fil-A for them to get high scores on their biology exam because I wanted to have really good scores. I knew they could do it. Of course, we worked on the, the content, but I said, if you guys can get an average of this uh, score and we can move the needle, I will buy you chicken sandwiches for the day after the exam or whatever, when we get the results of the exam. Now these are six, 16, 17 year old kids who could have purchased their own chicken sandwich, driven themselves to Chick-fil-A and gotten their own chicken sandwich. Some of them even work at Chick-fil-A. Um, but that incentive, I'll tell you, they worked for it, you know, and it, and it, it, it helped. We still had to get the intrinsic value of working towards a goal. And of course, I still had to really work on those skills so they could be successful. But it, it, extrinsic value, uh, extrinsic rewards work. Chicken sandwiches, Jolly Ranchers, Blow Pops, Twizzlers, any uh, a trip to the treasure chest, you know, those are all things we do in real life. On the exam, though, we want to stick with those intrinsic rewards. What, why are we doing this, right? Um, so that's one. Another one is, like it said there, lowering the standard. If you're new to teaching, you might think, well, when I give a student uh, a, a, a book or a passage that's below grade level because they're reading below grade level, isn't that lowering the standard? Arguably, yes. But we still have to keep that standard high. We give the student maybe a lower level text temporarily to help reinforce maybe those fluency skills or those reading skills so we can push, push, push and get them on grade level. Okay. So that's really important. Just want to do a shout out to the new teachers because you might be like, but in my school, we do that. Of course you do. But on the test, think perfect world. We have all the resources we need, all the support we need, and we have time to differentiate for every single student and meet every single student. We should try to do that anyways, but I understand in the real world, it is a lot different. Okay. Um, can we get extended time taking the praxis test? If you need accommodation, so if you have a documented learning disability or some sort of medical situation, you can apply to get extra time on the praxis. Just Google praxis accommodations and there's a form and there's a whole process you have to go through. They don't make it easy, but you can and sometimes you can get extended time, okay? 
All right. So giving students extra 10 minutes in a center for listening would be intrinsic. Uh, Ruthie, that's a great question. Giving students 10 minutes extra time could be differentiation. So if you're walking around the room and you see that students still need time, that's an observation. You're using a formative assessment and you might be like, oh, you know what? My students need more time. So you make an instructional decision to extend the time. It's not really an, a reward <laughs> to stay in the reading center. It's more of a differentiation. So um, that is a data-driven decision, uh, Ruthie. So that's actually a good decision. And I would call that not intrinsic, but formative. I would call that formative assessment. Okay. Your breakdown really helped me already. Awesome, Amy. I'm so glad. Um, all right. So let's move on to the social studies portion of it. Now that we've gotten through a few of those questions, you can still ask questions in the chat and Yana will be in there to help you there. Let's go over here and let's hit social studies. Okay. Again, I was talking to you about social studies is going to be a little bit on geography, you know, U.S. history, stuff like that, but it's also going to have some stuff on like our social emotional uh, growth, okay? And that's what we can see here. If I go to the answer choices for number six, I can see I have self-pacing, self-esteem, self-actualization, and self-efficacy, right? So let's have a look at number six. Students in a first grade classroom are sharing their tools, sharing is caring in pre-K, during an activity. They also clean up after the activity is over, a task they have practiced several times before. They understand that when they work together to learn and clean up, they will have a positive experience in the classroom. This is an example of, this is self-efficacy, all right? And self-efficacy is when students understand kind of that if I do this, the reward is a better social interaction, a better result in my learning. This is when we teach students like, um, we all have to contribute to clean up the classroom. This classroom is everybody's, right? So we want to make sure that if we are using things, we put them back. Um, or, uh, you know, Jose, can you please help Julia pick up her books or whatever? And just saying, wow, thank you so much, Jose. That is so helpful. You're showing students those intrinsic rewards. This is all about intrinsic rewards. And that by doing these things, it's going to lead to a better experience. Now, self-pacing, it's kind of a throwaway on this question. I just was using all self, self, self. Um, self-pacing is basically figuring out what your pace is and just going at your own pace. Self-esteem is the way we think about ourselves. Now you may be tempted to choose that, but self-esteem could be low or high. And we're not really talking about that in here. We're talking about the process of contributing basically to our classroom society. And self-actualization, that's at the top of the Maslow's hierarchy. Um, I'm just going to do this here. I'm not going to write them all in, but you know that this is the basic needs met here. This is going to be in order for students to learn, they have to have food and shelter, right? A lot of you know, if you're teaching at-risk students or students who are homeless, it's really hard for them to do the math homework if they don't have a safe place to sleep at night, if they're stressed out because their parents are homeless. These are things that affect our students. And when that bottom tier of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is not met, nothing else can really happen happen. This is why teachers have granola bars in their desk drawers. This is why a lot of high school teachers, myself included, had deodorant and other um, shampoo and things like that in my classroom to give to students because some of them don't get that at home because they're, they're struggling. So that bottom tier are those basic needs. The next tier is safety. Safety. So um, is my home a safe place? Is, is, you know, do I have the big bad wolf who lives in my home who may be abusive, things like that. If that's happening, students are going to have a really hard time doing the math homework, right? Then we get up here, love and belonging. That's why we stand at our doors and we say, good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. Hey, Jose, great to see you. Hey, Susie, so nice for you to join us today. I'm so excited to see you. That's showing students love and belonging because when they get that, they're more apt to learn. And then at the top, 
where we are all trying to get to, some days I'm there, some days I'm not, is self-actualization. What is my purpose? What does it all mean? This is the top of the pyramid and it cannot be reached really at this young age. I mean, somewhat it can, some would argue with that it can, but really self-actualization comes with a lot of work and a lot of reflection and a lot of understanding about our world. Usually pre-K through third students don't get self-actualization. We all want that. We're all working on that. But if any one of these tiers are not met, you're not going to get to the self-actualization. But this particular uh, question is talking about self-efficacy. Be on the lookout for that on the test. All right, let's have a look at number eight. So this is a good one to work backwards. We have some scenarios in the answer choices here. Have students work in cooperative groups to vote on classroom procedures. Okay, a couple things. I like the word procedures with students, whether they're pre-K to third or college students. Practice routines and procedures are very important. And in this case, they're voting on them which is kind of good because you are including them in the process of establishing procedures. This is good. I'll keep it. B, have students work together to complete tasks. All right, that one's not bad either. Show a video about how a bill is passed. Okay, be careful about videos. Do we use videos in the real world? Yes, but social studies teachers sometimes Sometimes I'm not generalizing all social studies teacher teachers, but I was an assistant principal and I did a lot of classroom walkthroughs. And uh, sometimes in social studies, we rely too heavily on videos. And if the video aligns with the standards, that's great, but we should show clips of videos and then move to discussion and writing activities around that. Showing a two hour video over the course of three days is not the best practice. If you guys are, are uh, looking for good evaluations, don't rely too much on videos, okay? I don't like C, I'm gonna cross it off. D, have a guest speaker present important aspects of democracy. All right, you might say guest speaker is cool. A guest speaker is a lecture. It's just like having another person in the room talk to students. It's typically not the correct answer on the test. So I can cross off C and D, narrows it down to A and B. I like A the best, let's go with the question, which of the following is most effective activity to demonstrate democracy? Well, we have vote on classroom procedures. So A is the best. You might say, well, showing a video about how a bill is passed, that's democracy because we elect our uh, representatives and our senators. And if we show how a bill is passed, that's kind of like checks and balances, all that stuff. Yeah, but it's a video. In this case, they're actually engaging in democracy. They're actually doing it. That's why A is most effective. And you'll see this term in the questions, most effective. It's saying A, B, C, and D are all somewhat effective, but which one is most effective? And that's going to be A. So be on the lookout for that term, most effective. All right, let's move to science. Remember, science is going to be earth space, life, and physical science. So physical, oh, I forgot to mention physical science when I was breaking this down. Physical science is all physics. So it's going to be um, machine, simple machines, uh, molecules, atoms, um, lightning, uh, convection, conduction, electricity, things like that. Um, and then of course, life science is bio. So that's going to be your cells and then your ecosystems and then your food webs and things like that. And then of course, uh, your earth space is going to be planets, moon, sun, stars. And then of course the surface of the earth, which is going to be mountains, ca uh, canyons, um, earthquakes, things like that. All right. So let's have a look at that. So right away, I'm going to look at the answer choices. And I see curiosity and inquiry. Now, if I'm thinking about science, curiosity and inquiry is like the ticket. That's what we're trying to teach students. Be curious about the world and inquire and question about the wor world, okay? Now we have diligence and perseverance. Well, we do want to teach students that, but if we're in the science section, we're probably leaning more towards curiosity and inquiry, skepticism and cynicism. Now we do want students to have a heavy dose of skepticism. We do want them to question that kind of goes with inquiry, but cynicism, we don't want to teach pre-K kids to be cynical yet. They have their whole lives to be cynics. We don't need to teach them that. I'm going to cross that off because it's negative. Anything with a negative connotation, we want to get rid of it. And D, interest and happiness. Well, that's great, but 
Curiosity and inquiry is a better answer choice here. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following is most important in the early childhood science classroom? 100% curiosity and inquiry. If you see these words in an answer choice, slow down. It's probably the correct answer. All right. Let's have a look at number four. Now, this is more specific to just science, like an actual science question that if you've been out of the si elementary science classroom for a long time, you might be like, oh my God, I forgot what's an open circulatory system and a closed circulatory system. So I can see that here. And I have fish, cow, human, grasshopper. All right. Right away, if I didn't know, okay, I could eliminate cow and human. This is a think like a test maker strategy because they're both mammals and they're similar in that way. So I could like cross those off because they probably have similar circulatory systems, but that would lead me to leave it with fish and grasshopper. Well, an open circulatory system is a grasshopper. So basically bugs, insects, mollusks, we, they have an open circulatory system. That means the air just comes into their body. All right. Or, or the oxygen just comes into their body. There are holes in a grasshopper called spiracles, I believe. And the oxygen just comes into the body. Grasshoppers don't have lungs and they don't have gills. Um, things with lungs and gills, those are closed circulatory systems because like humans, we have lungs. We have to take the air in and push it out. Now it is kind of a uh, automatic process. We don't think about every breath we take in and out, right? But there is a closed system where the air comes in or the oxygen comes in and then we breathe out the carbon dioxide. And in fish, it's done through gills. In a cow, it's done through lungs. And in a human, it's done through lungs. So open circulatory systems, insects and mollusks, open circulatory systems, fish, mammals, humans, closed circulatory systems. All right. And that's all covered in the book as well. All right. Let's have a look at number 10. So I can see from the answer choices, we have some quotes here. These rocks are very pretty. I like this rock better than the other rock. This rock feels smooth and the rest, and this rock feels rough. I have rocks like this in my backyard. Okay. See, I like only because when we're thinking about rocks, we think about texture when we're classifying rocks, so smooth versus uh, rough, hard versus soft, those are some ways in which we think about rocks. So I'm already setting myself up here to think about the question. C is looking good. Let's have a look. A teacher brings in different types of rocks for students to pass around and make observations. Also, observations is a good word on this exam for the science. Which of the following would be an example of an observation that would aid in classifying rocks? Well, pretty is up to the person, right? What's pretty to you might not pretty be pretty to me. So we can't really classify rocks based on this. I like this one better than that one. Also an opinion. Smooth versus rough. That is how we classify rocks. And I have these rocks in my backyard. Doesn't help us classify. So C is the best answer there. All right. Let's get into health PE creative arts. This is going to be a small portion of the exam. All right. Now, this could be difficult. The PE and, and the actual PE exam, for those of you who are trying to be PE teachers, is a tough exam. There's a lot of anatomy and things like that in the exam. But for this test, it's going to be pretty surface. You're not going to be required to be like a, a perfect PE teacher, but you do have to know some of the bigger concepts. So let's have a look at the, question, or the answer choices here. Read a play to students and analyze each character. Okay, that's all right. Uh, you're reading a play to students. I like the word analyze. It's higher order. I'll keep it. B, allow students to dress up as their favorite character and act out a scene in the play. So this is role play. Um, I like this the most because it's the most inquiry based. Students are actually engaging in the learning rather than sitting back and listening to you read. B is looking good to me. C, have students read a play in cooperative groups. This is also good. Cooperative groups is good, but I don't like it as much as I like B. Have students listen to a play in their listening center. Well, this is good too. Listening helps with fluency. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following activities would su support dramatic play in a classroom of three-year-olds? Well, if we want to support dramatic play, which is part of the creative arts, we want students to act that out. So B is going to be the best answer there. All right, let's have a look at number four. Um, I see hopping, writing, sewing, drawing. 
can't do anything there. Which of the following activities would increase gross motor skills? All right, let's break that down. Gross motor skills are the big skills in your body. So your legs, your arms, your torso, gross motor skills. Um, hopping, running, jumping, those use the big muscles in your body. So A is going to be uh, the best answer here. Writing, like taking your hand and holding the pencil and sewing with the needle and really like holding on to the, the needle and pushing it through a small hole and drawing, also writing and drawing. Those could be crossed out because they're too similar and we only get one correct answer here. But B, C, and D are fine motor skills. They use the small bones and the small muscles. And those are really hard for little kids, right? A little kid can hop and jump pretty easily um, unless they have a, uh, an exceptionality, of course, that prevents them from doing that. But from the time they're really little, they can hop, jump, do all kinds of stuff. When it comes to like picking up something small on the table or writing, handwriting, or those things, those are fine motor skills. They come later. So A is going to be the best answer there because we're talking about those big, gross motor, motor skills. Okay. And the last one, number eight. Let's have a look at the answer choices. This is a good one because it's a scenario. Model different scenarios of the game. All right, I like model. Modeling for all students, but especially uh, pre-K through third students is very powerful because you're showing students. You're not just telling students, you're showing them. Modeling is a part of direct, explicit instruction and is typically a correct answer on this exam. Okay, so I like it. B, give students a handout to accompany the rules presentation. All right, I like a handout, giving them more to kind of look at, maybe check off a checklist. That's good, but not as good as modeling. So A is still my front runner here. C, ask the assistant principal to help. Nope, never the correct answer. The assistant principal is, is uh, busy, whether it's behavior or anything else. Do not choose this answer choice. And I would say in real life, do not... Um, use this either. Principals are busy. And if you are constantly calling the administration team for help, you're kind of setting yourself up to be seen as not someone who doesn't have classroom management. You've got to try to handle some of this stuff in on your own in your classroom. Now, of course, if there's an emergency, if you have something really big, you want to call admin, but little things don't do it. And on this test, it's not the correct answer. Start the game with no rules because the students are not ready yet. Absolutely not. We know that that is not going to work. A looks like it's my best answer. Let's read the question stem. Um, he has told them over and over, but they still do not seem to understand. So he's told them. Now he has to show them modeling. A handout might help, but modeling the rules is much more, uh, much more effective. Let's read the rest. Notice I'm still working backwards. Mr. Rodriguez is a pre-kindergarten PE teacher. He is having a hard time getting students to understand the different rules of soccer. Well, the best way to get students to understand is to model. And this goes for classroom procedures too. You can't just write the classroom procedures on the board. And I have a whole webinar on uh, how to start your school year off with success. And I go over classroom management. You got to model. You got to show the kids. Like I, even with high school kids, I would say, okay, everybody watch me. This is how I want you to come into the classroom. And I would go outside and come into the classroom and show them exactly how I wanted them to do it. Um, modeling, if we're writing an essay, I would project an essay onto the board and show them how I would move paragraphs around and edit sentences for a PE teacher here, modeling the different ways in which the rules apply to soccer. So modeling is really important, typically a correct answer choice on the exam, be on the lookout for that. A is the best answer here. All right. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed it today. Let me know if you have any questions. Now, remember, we are going to send you an email after this webinar is over. Within about an hour, you're going to get an email from us. It's going to have basically the link again, the replay link, so you can rewatch this later. Um, it's going to have the free study guide and it's going to have anything I talked about. So it's probably going to have a link to the test specs. It's going to have a link to the blog that I talked about and anything else that I can think of that's important for you. It's also going to have an offer code that you can use to get 20% off the online course or the book. Remember, 
If you already bought the book on Amazon and you want to get the online course because you want more support, reach out to us with a screenshot, your name visible, please, so we know it was you who purchased the book. We will send you an offer code to get that amount off the online course, and you'll get 20% off because you attended this webinar as well, all right? So just let us know that. Um, I'm so glad you guys have found this valuable. It looks like a lot of you have found it valuable. You guys are all kind of saying thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank you for being here with me on a Saturday. Be on the lookout for that email. Check your spam folder too and drag it to your main inbox so you don't miss anything from me. I am so glad that you guys joined me today. I hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Relax. You've done a lot so far. And let us know if you have any um, questions. Really quickly, I do want to share with you real quick. Um, if you need more help and you like my videos, if you like this webinar, hop over to my YouTube channel. I have tons of videos. Look at Praxis 1 versus Praxis 2. Somebody asked me that question. How to calculate your Praxis score, how to pass the 5001. I also have a teaching reading playlist here. This is huge. If you are looking for free resources because you're broke, and I totally understand teachers don't have a lot of extra money, using this to help you pass your exams will help a lot. I go through practice test questions, you know, the alphabetic principle, all these different things. I have writing tutorials. I have lots and lots of things here on my YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and all of that. And I am on TikTok. So I do shorter versions of what I do on YouTube. So if you like the short stuff, and a lot of people do, you can go here. There's tons of, you know, assessments, discourse versus pragmatics. There's lots of different videos here on TikTok. I'm getting a pretty good following there. I'd love it if you would follow me there. And of course, we're on Facebook and um, uh, we are on Facebook and Instagram. We're everywhere. So just follow me wherever you can. Check out my website for more information. And I really appreciate um, you for being here with me today on a Saturday. I know you're probably tired and could use a break. So I'm going to give you that. 